Hello, everyone. Today is a very important episode of the Unisoft question. My guest is a judge of the Federal Court of Appeal, Justice David Stratus. Hello, Justice Stratus. Hello. Great to, great to be here, uh, uh, Pulat. I, I uh, look forward to it very much. I listen to your podcast, and um, you have such an interesting cross-section of people in the legal system. I enjoy it very much. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. I usually start with some uh, biographical sketch. I th I'm sure yours is as interesting as uh, any other person's. So you were, the, the official bios say that you were born in Toronto, but I think you can be more specific than that. Yeah, uh, we all say Toronto, but I was actually born in, in Scarborough. And uh, I know that you grew up in the 70s. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in the 70s in the Scarborough? I want to chart yeah. your uh, path from Scarborough beginnings to law school and then on, onward from there. Yeah, for sure. I, Scarborough, uh, for those who don't know the Toronto area, is an east end suburb of, of Toronto. Um, people might describe it as a little more working class than than some areas of Toronto. Uh, certainly it's not an area where many people with money and wealth settle. Um, it's, uh, uh, I think it was a wonderful place to grow up. It was filled with uh, a very uh, large number of, of ordinary, uh, good, hard, hardworking people. Um, interesting thing you asked about when I grew up there, uh, my formative years, I was born in, in 1960, but in my formative years were very much the 1970s. And Scarborough was interesting then, Pulat, uh, because in the 70s, there was a large amount of immigration and Scarborough changed uh, and, and became uh, very multicultural indeed. And, and um, uh, immigrants from uh, many parts of the world, uh, you name it, it, it was there. And it was a very interesting place to grow up for sure. Um, I, by background, I'm a Greek Canadian. Um, my four grandparents all emigrated to Canada. And I was raised very much in the Greek culture and tradition. Um, I, uh, uh, for instance, uh, was uh, 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 and am a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. We celebrate our Easter and Good Friday on a different day from other Christians. Um, and, and so sometimes, you know, um, and I had some, some Greek features. Sometimes, you know, you would get some, some, I wouldn't call it more than a little trash talk about that. Um, so, so I understood when the recent immigrants came, uh, I sort of, felt a bond with them and understood where they was coming from. I mean, there was so much immigration at the time, Pulat, that you'd be sitting in, say, a grade two class and, and uh, all of a sudden new kids uh, from places around the world would be coming into the class. It was very interesting. You know, you preempted my question about your parents. You started talking yeah. about your family. I'm yeah. really curious about your parents. We all know sure. who you are today. Yeah. We all know about your stellar path more recently, but what role uh, did your parents play in that? Did they send you off on that uh, uh, voyage or uh, you were different and you did it on your own? Tell us more about your parents. Oh, oh, oh I didn't do it on my own. Uh, my, my parents were, were and are, my mother's still alive, uh, wonderful people. Uh, my late father uh, was a veterinarian, very hardworking. He would, he would work from, uh, you know, he'd leave the house around quarter after eight or 8.30 in the morning. He'd come home for dinner and then have an evening shift at his veterinary mm -hmm. office until mm -hmm. nine or 10 at night. Um, my mother uh, stayed at home, but was uh, probably best described as a community volunteer. It was very active, incidentally, in um, uh, multiculturalism and would organize uh, cultural festivals and 
things like that for um, the multicultural community in Scarborough, which, as I said, was growing up. Uh, my parents were wonderful. They were, they were so devoted to me and my two brothers. Um, but a, a huge formative uh, experience uh, or influence was uh, the public school system. I had amazing, dedicated teachers in the public school system um, all the way through. From, from junior kindergarten all the way up through what was then grade 13. Um, these people were uh, true mentors and really set me on the course to, uh, to, to other things. Uh, were your parents born in Greece or here no, in Canada? Here in Canada, uh, my mm. mother uh, and her family come from Saskatoon in Saskatchewan. Mm. Uh, my father, is uh, Toronto born, downtown Toronto born, um, but all four, sorry, three of the four grandparents came from Greece. And uh, on my dad's side, uh, my grandmother came from Hamburg in Germany uh, and um, uh, all brought the culture. Uh, my German uh, grandmother kind of adapted the Greek culture of her husband. And so really the influence was, was very heavily Greek. Yes. So it's really interesting to me. You went to law school uh, at Queens yes. and uh, you were good enough uh, in law school that you were accepted as a clerk uh, for the Supreme Court of Canada Judge Bertha Wilson. Yes. Just before that, Poulet, I also did graduate work at Oxford. But yes, 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 definitely. So I wanted to touch on uh, uh, Oxford, but I, sure. uh, I'm thinking about this immigration topic, this immigration um, or, or diversity theme, yeah. and uh, you, your parents even were not uh, immigrants. They were born in Canada. You That's were right. born in Canada, but right. the Supreme Court of Canada judge that you clerked for was an immigrant. She was an immigrant, all right. Bertha she came Wilson, from Scotland. Absolutely, Bertha Wilson from Kirkcaldy in Scotland. Yep. And she came from Scotland at a fairly mature age of 26, if I'm not mistaken. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Did she have a Scottish accent? Oh, she sure did. A, a <laughs> lovely, soft brogue. Very charming. Yeah. This, this is interesting. So, yeah. uh, but, so before, uh, you said that before the Supreme Court uh, clerkship, you um, went to Oxford. That's is that correct. correct? And what did you do at Oxford? I, I was at Balliol College in Oxford, and I did... Uh, a graduate law program called the BCL. Strangely, you could do it in one or two years. I had funding, so I did uh, funding from scholarships and, and uh, uh, did the two-year BCL. Bachelor of Civil Law, it's called, but it's actually a graduate degree. It's called Bachelor because I think it was the second degree ever at Oxford. They didn't have such things as master degrees. So, But it's a great course, very heavy in the scholarship of law it was a it was a difficult program was it ever a choice for you to be either an academic or a lawyer oh, that's a great question um yes uh i definitely was interested in the academic study of law but i also wanted to practice practice fascinated me and uh i wanted uh, at that age and stage i wanted to try it out so, you know, uh, the great Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And that's what I did. I kind of ended up doing both. I practiced law, but I was an academic lawyer and did a lot of uh, speaking, teaching and writing, um, teaching at Queen's Law School since 1994. Uh, and uh, so I kind of had a foot in both camps. Uh, me, to be candid, I was never a serious academic. Uh, compared to those who teach in law schools. But I did publish the odd thing and certainly like to lecture at conferences and so on. And you still publish uh, academically, I believe. Yeah. You, you have a, uh, a running article um, in the Canadian Law of Judicial Review. Uh, oh, yes. About uh, the judicial review and administrative law. Yes, I, I uh, decided... Um, about three years ago that I should take all my PowerPoints from, from the lectures and seminars and judicial education I've been doing all, all through the years. And I put them all together, wrote a few things to connect them. And all of a sudden I had a veritable 
textbook on administrative law. So I decided for access to justice reasons more than anything else to make this available publicly and for free so that those who are unfamiliar with administrative law could um, uh, sort of get a quick primer on uh, the leading cases, some of the more important uh, cases from intermediate appellate courts, sometimes first instance courts, uh, so that um, you know, the cost of ascertaining the law would be reduced. You know, I, I've never forgotten when I first started to practice law, that horrible feeling when you really need to come up with an answer fast and you don't know much about the subject area and you're drowning in cases and there isn't a good textbook. What mm -hmm. do you do? Uh, I've always got that person front of mind uh, in the judgments I write, but also in this project. So I decided to do this pool app just to solve that problem. And for those interested, this, this document is on the ssrn.com uh, site. You're welcome even to download it. I don't assert copyright over it. It's just there as a helpful resource for people to use in their own private study or if they need to ascertain the law for their clients. I've also done um, uh, a similar sort of thing uh, in um, uh, legal writing to help people with the legal writing. There's a long s discussion or presentation at, at the same place. And um, little breaking news is that awfully soon, I'm going to be releasing a practice and procedure guide to the federal court system as well. Same philosophy, just to make the law known uh, so, to, so people don't drown, so they can find quickly and cheaply relevant law. From there, they have to research and fine tune it to their cases, but at least I can give them the foundation. I think anyone who will Google your name will easily find those resources. And I strongly recommend uh, all lawyers who are um, working on uh, admin cases, judicial review cases, to find a Justice Stratus's uh, paper, the Canadian Law of Judicial Review, some doctrine cases, just Google Justice Stratus's name, and it's up there on the first page. Yeah. You, you know, there are different strands in your professional DNA, and one of the strands is Osler's. Mm -hmm. And uh, Osler is is, uh, is a big firm, and uh, I began I, there, Pulak. Yes, you started there. First yes. Place. So, um, quite several guests of this show come from Osler's, including uh, Justice Fred Myers. Yes, sir. And, and I, I, I think you two were there around the same time. Have you <laughs> met sure him? Were. Have you met him? <laughs> oh, listen. I, uh, I, Justice Myers was in the year above me in seniority, so we were both associates and and uh, for a, sh a shortish time partners at Osler Hoskin. Um, as a matter of fact, he was just two doors down the hall from from me. We were always close. I, I think our separate career paths, uh, you know, we're not in touch all the time, but once in a blue moon, we have dinner together, emails with each other. Um, I just have to tell you, um, I admire Justice Myers and as a person, but also his work, particularly on practice and procedure. He properly understands how important practice and procedure is. And in the Ontario court system, he's so vital to its operation. I, I think the world of him. You know, I think what you two have in common, and I don't know if it's a function of your common uh, uh, history, you are both fighting for lawyer competency and you, you are doing something really specific. You are writing articles. Uh, Justice uh, Myers is uh, working uh, on that issue through his decisions, which are like articles. Many lawyers use them as a resource. So I, I find also, that a also Pulat is case management too. Right. He, he's brilliant at uh, those kinds of issues, and he does a lot of education through that as well. Yeah. How did you find yourself on the admin law path? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. When I was at Oxford, I was uh, very much a 
private law lawyer and did not do administrative law or constitutional law, I think the clerkship with uh, the wonderful Bertha Wilson um, really opened up my ideas to those areas of law. When I entered Osler's afterwards to practice, I discovered that in the litigation department of that time, relatively few specialized in that area. It was an area of, uh, of uh, low occupancy. So it was a very good thing for an ambitious young associate to kind of occupy. You'd get files and interesting files at that. Uh, another area too that at the time um, wasn't well occupied was, uh, was factum writing. Uh, the rules in Ontario were substantially amended in 1984, I believe, or 85. And, and for the first time, factums were introduced into many Ontario stages and Ontario proceedings. And um, uh, people didn't know how to do factums. I developed that skill uh, pretty much on my own, I must say. There weren't many conferences back then. And that became a specialty area within Osler's uh, and I developed that skill. And uh, being asked by a senior lawyer to write a factum uh, is often a ticket to an interesting case. And sometimes those cases were administrative law or constitutional law. So it kind of developed from there. And you know, you get a case, you find it interesting, you develop an expertise, people give you more cases like that and your expertise snowballs. There is an expression um, that um, sounds like the rise of administrative state. Yeah. And uh, it seems to me that as government is becoming more pervasive as and government action is becoming more pervasive, administrative law is becoming more and more a sought after area of practice, an elite, oh, if sure. you will, area of practice, because lawyers see it as an opportunity to uh, contend with the most powerful party out there, the government. Yes. And uh, it's one thing to represent or to act against a large corporation, but it's another thing wh when you can serve your clients in their uh, endeavor to contend with the government. Yes. And not a lot of political systems provide this opportunity to, to seek yes. review of government action. Yes. And our system does. So do you share this view? And do you think the administrative state is rising? And uh, when, you, when you answer that, can you address Vavilov and how Vavilov uh, represents this trend if, uh, if it does? Sure. Uh, there's so much there. Let me unpack it. First of all, the rise of the administrative state. Um, if you go physically into a library. <laughs> we often don't have to anymore, but suppose you did. Look at the RSO 1960 statute books. Look at RSO 1970. Look at RSO 1980. Look at RSO 1990. What you see is a steady increase in the number of volumes. It's even more pronounced for the RRO volumes, the regulations. That has uh, accelerated since 1990, which was last Ontario statutory revision. Um, what administrative law is, is whether uh, an administrative actor has uh, the power under legislation to do what uh, they say they do, and the reasonableness of their decisions under that legislation. And so with the rise of legislation, um, you get more and more decisions and thus more and more potential judicial reviews. Added to that, uh, Poulat would be uh, the sheer complexity of the issues that have risen. Um, the issues that arose when I started practice are, are child's play compared to the complex issues that lawyers have to deal with today. You know, a, a, as a judge, uh, just to illustrate this, in 2009, uh, I was appointed. In 2010, I would guess that in the year 2010, I had maybe two uh, banned elections under the Indian Act, and that was the only Indigenous law that I had. Now, uh, 12 and a half years later, it's exploded. 
and indigenous law is a huge amount of what the federal courts do. And a lot of that is administrative law. So it's not just the amount of uh, government action that has caused this increase, but the sheer complexity of it. Um, I think as well, uh, uh, the public, the clients of lawyers have become more rights conscious. And this has also fueled a view that um, uh, they sometimes need to challenge government decision-making. And finally, in Canada, I think compared to other jurisdictions, there's a strong accountability ethic, at least in the administrative law world. Um, the dominant view in Canada, perhaps outside of government, is that um, administrative actors um, need to be held accountable for the public decisions they make. And in that regard, I think we're uh, more pro accountability than say the United Kingdom or even the US. Interesting. Yeah. And of course, the, the thing about administrative law, as anyone who went to law school uh, knows, is that every once in a while, the judicial review doctrine is rewritten by the Supreme Court of Canada. Alas, yes. Uh, so when I was, uh, when I was in uh, law school, Justice Sawson's book, yes. Administrative Law in Context, uh, was uh, current. And uh, I mean, I'm sure it's current still. I'm just referring to the different edition, to the 2008 edition. And uh, the, uh, the case that governed uh, or the leading case at the time was Dunsmuir. Right. This is what we learned in law school. So to, right. And then after Dunsmuir, I never did a lot of admin law, but I know that there was another case or the, the jurisprudence evolved after Dunsmuir and then Vavilov happened. Right. So what did Vavilov do to our admin law? Right. Well, I'll take you back one step. Even before Dunsmuir, there were many other iterations of uh, the law of substantive review of administrative decision making. And, and uh, I think there were two other tests, major tests, before Dunsmuir. I wrote in a controversial article in 2016 that every 10 years, it seems you know, there's a revision of the law. I talked about a never ending construction site where one crew comes on, demolishes what was done before and creates something new. Um, I've got good news for you. Uh, Vavilov, which really happened as a result of a lot of the criticism that, that people were throwing at Dunsmuir, Vavilov has solved a lot of the problems of substantive review of administrative decision making. I read uh, just about every appellate court decision on Vavilov, and that's because I do a lot of judicial teaching, uh, aside from the fact that as a judge, I should stay current. I can tell you that there are very few big issues after Vavilov. Vavilov has been clear, relatively easy for people to understand. And nobody, not even the academic community, is calling yet for any major revision to it. The Supreme Court of Canada hit it out of the park. They did a fabulous job in Vavilov. So <laughs> someone's going to see this 10 years from now, so I'm a little worried. But maybe, just maybe, Vavilov is going to be with us for a very long time. I, what Vavilov did, in a nutshell, is it recognized that in administrative law, you're dealing with so many different types of decision makers under so many different types of statutes. And some of them need to be reviewed very quickly, uh, uh, very fussily for various types of reasons. Others you have to give a little more leeway to for various types of reasons. Um, Dunsmuir put us in a straight jacket. And, and sort of one size fits all approach to how we review these tribunals. That's a, a, at odds to really this problem of the multitude of decisions and decision makers. Vavilov goes with that reality and adopted a contextual approach to review, where in some cases, 
were appropriately very fussy of decision-making, and in other cases, somewhat more deferential to decision-making. And it gives us guidance on when we should be fussy and when we should be a little more deferential. And so far it's working. There isn't much confusion. Lawyers are spending less time arguing these points in court. And, and what we're finding post Vavlov is people are getting to the real issue, which is yes or no, uh, should this administrative decision stand? And, and you know, before under the Dunsmuir rubric, we'd have these metaphysical endless debates, sometimes for hours on what the standard of review should be. Uh, it was very counterproductive and pointless. So, so I say, way to go, Supreme Court of Canada. You did a great job in Vavlov. I want to say that the Supreme Court of Canada cited you quite a few times in Vavlov. Well, I mean, the decisions of my court. I mean, I, I authored some of those decisions. I think overall there were about like 14, but uh, you have to understand that any decision from from our court is a panel of three. And before something goes out, people sure do make suggestions. Uh, but in, in, in addition to your decisions, they cited your uh, Queen's Law Journal article. That's the controversial one in 2016, yeah. Why was it controversial? Well, it was controversial because I really attacked uh, Dunsmuir and, and mm. what the Supreme Court in particular had done post uh, Dunsmuir. And, and uh, it, it was uh, unusual for a sitting judge to sort of raise a concern of that sort. It's not unprecedented, though, uh, but it certainly caused a lot of chatter. I wrote two other articles. Uh, one was in Paul Daly's excellent blog, Administrative Law Matters, and another was in uh, the Double Aspect uh, blog of Leonid Sirota and uh, Mark Mancini. Uh, I wrote two articles there too, and they were fairly provocative as well. The Vavil of Appeal was from your panel's decision. Indeed, a split, a split decision. Uh, right. I had the majority in Justice Gleason in dissent, and it really kind of said between the lines, hey, Supreme Court, you really need to fix this area up. And to their credit, they took it. It was a great set of facts to do it. What do you think about this relationship between the Supreme Court of Canada and uh, courts of appeal, or maybe even lower courts, this role of precedence, how binding it is? What, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I, I do have thoughts on it. Um, and um, a lot of a lot of lawyers and, and a lot of judges, too, they look at the judiciary with its various different levels and they see it almost like a military where captains have to salute majors, majors have to salute colonels and colonels have to salute um, uh, the generals and, and anyone who doesn't obey is insubordinate. Uh, that may be how it works in, in the military, but the reality is a good functioning judiciary is a healthy dialogue. I liken it very much uh, to a law firm where there's junior partners, then there's intermediate partners, then there's very senior partners. And obviously at the end of the day, uh, for the good of the firm, we respect and obey what the senior partner says. But the dialogue between the branches is extremely important. And you know that model of how the various courts work uh, was set out by the Supreme Court in a case called Crown and Henry, uh, 2005 SCC 76. Uh, Justice Binney, he doesn't use the metaphor of a partnership or senior or junior partners, but he encourages uh, courts below the Supreme Court, in particular intermediate courts of appeal, to, to speak on issues of law, to, to sometimes criticize uh, aspects of Supreme Court decisions. Ultimately, the Supreme Court has to decide uh, and, and, and their decision has to be obeyed. Um, and, but the fact that they have the last word and it's binding doesn't mean there's no dialogue. Uh, 
You know, Pulat, uh, one of the problems I'm sure as a practicing lawyer, you see this all the time. The Supreme Court sometimes releases decisions and in the interests of unanimity or, or close to unanimity, um, the reasons aren't always that clear. They sometimes contain the suggestions of various judges. I sometimes talk about some decisions looking like a box of chocolates, where not all the chocolates are the same. And that kind of empowers us to take the chocolates we like and perhaps leave some other chocolates back in the box. And so intermediate appellate courts in particular uh, have the very important task of uh, interpreting Supreme Court jurisprudence and sometimes reinterpreting if something doesn't quite make sense. Now, the Supreme Court can always grant leave and tell us whether we're right or wrong, but this is part of the dialogue that takes place, particularly between the Supreme Court and uh, intermediate appellate courts. If uh, I'm sorry, it's such a long-winded answer. I'm really uh, fascinated by this and study it academically as well. If you want to see an academic treatment of this phenomena, uh, there's a there's a U.S. academic professor Richard M. Ray R. E. Uh, and he's written a classic article called "Narrowing Supreme Court Precedent from Below," and uh, it it. it its thesis is intermediate appellate courts in the U.S. do this all the time. And he adds, it's a good thing because it's led to appropriate revision of the law and it's led to the Supreme Court sometimes revisiting its own precedents. You know, a great example in your jurisdiction, Poulat, in Ontario, is uh, the Ontario Court of Appeals reaction to, uh, to uh, SATFA and the issue of the standard of review of private arbitrations. Um, the Ontario Court of Appeal has, has actually voiced views about SATFA and where it's going. And the Supreme Court has rendered two later decisions on the same point. And courts of appeal all across the country, frankly, are dialoguing back with the Supreme Court. This is how our common law develops, and it's a wonderful thing. But don't think for a moment that as a lower court judge below the Supreme Court, uh, I'm not allowed to express my views. I should express my views appropriately uh, when I think there's a problem. Ultimately, I have to respect and do respect what the Supreme Court says. Absolutely. This is fascinating and I think every law student in this country should listen to this and probably every lawyer. Lawyers and litigation lawyers need to know uh, the doctrine of precedent. You know, a fabulous article that talks about the legalities of precedent was recently written by Justice Rowe with, uh, alongside one of his law clerks, and, and it's superb. That tells you how it works in terms of legalities, mm -hmm. but in terms of practicalities, uh, I've just explained it to you. And so when you're making submissions about a Supreme Court case, mm -hmm. uh, remember the leeway that uh, courts appeal have to interpret and reinterpret sometimes leading jurisprudence. Great example is the Supreme Court Section 15 decision in Fraser. It contains certain uncertainties in a decision last summer from my court that I wrote called Weatherly there is uh, an important interpretation of Fraser that tries to clear the doubt. Um, this is just how the doctrine of precedent works. You talked about vertical hierarchies just now and uh, precedent and deference, but we also have horizontal structures yeah. in our uh, judicial system, such as superior courts of provinces and the federal court, um, of Canada that are about on about the same level. The federal court of Canada is a trial court, but it seems like they're in, they live in different countries um, in, in the sense that our federal court is a statutory court and it doesn't hear usually the same types of cases that our superior courts hear. So I'm just curious about this whole uh, situation where we have a court with inherent jurisdiction that will exist regardless of any legislation. It is the superior court of a province. Yeah. It is constitutionally protected. It is the 
cornerstone of our independent independent judiciary you know in case you know some future government decides to abolish federal courts for example except for the supreme court of canada which is also in the constitution the the superior courts will still be there and it's it's really fascinating to me perhaps it's a little bit of a nerd out here but in theory superior courts can hear or have the power to hear all the same matters that uh, were channeled by statute to the federal court. They will, they will not usually, for, but they might occasionally. For example, I heard of very urgent last minute uh, deportation stays that were sought in the superior court. So can you talk a little bit uh, uh, about that, this interplay between inherent jurisdiction courts and federal courts, and what is it like not to have inherent jurisdiction uh, and all this, all this uh, stuff? Well, we do have inherent jurisdiction, as I'm about to explain. Okay. I, let me, and, and I think uh, the differences are vastly overstated. Uh, if you bear with me, I'm going to un- unpack this a bit. And, and it's important uh, because the federal courts in this country uh, play an enormous role, sometimes not as big as some people realize. You know, in, in uh, other uh, big democracies, federal democracies like the United States and Australia, federal courts are recognized and given pride of place. And the lawyers are very familiar with the federal courts when you go to them and what they do. For some reason in Canada, we seem to be asleep about the importance and the role of federal courts. Um, The first thing to know is um, there isn't much difference between the two, as I'll explain. If anyone's looking for further reading on this, check out my article. It's called a Judiciary Cleaved, Superior Courts, Statutory Courts, and the Illogic of Difference. You'll see this on SSRN, Google, and you'll get it. Another place is 2017, um, 58, uh, University of New Brunswick Law Journal, 54. Uh, we're not that different. And, and let me explain why. First of all, under section four of our statute, we're more than a statutory court. The act says that we are a superior court of law, equity, and admiralty with civil and criminal jurisdiction. As well, under the Judges Act, we are called superior court judges because we are. Um, Third, this issue of inherent powers. Um, When the Supreme Court talks about the inherent jurisdiction of superior courts, and you look at the articles it relies on, what it means is that if a subject matter is not covered by Section 101 federal courts or Section 96 provincial courts or Section 9214 provincial courts, uh, it all goes to the Superior Court. In other words, it's not so much inherent jurisdiction as residuary jurisdiction. But statutory courts have inherent powers. This was recognized by the Supreme Court in a case called Cunningham at at paragraph 19. Um, It's according to the Supreme Court, and and I certainly agree with this, inherent powers are necessarily implied in the grant of power that we have to function as a court of law. Um, So courts, for instance, have inherent powers like uh, the power to Uh, run a registry, the power to deal with dysfunctions within the procedures, to to deal with dysfunctional litigants or unmeritorious litigation. We have inherent power to uh, defend our courts against incursions by others and so on. If you want to know more about this in in the federal court system and our inherent powers, they were recently canvassed in a case called Dugre in Canada, D-U-G-R-E, and that's 2021 FCA 8. And they were also dealt with in um, a really fascinating case called Resection 6, 2020 FCA 137. And um, we, in our jurisdiction, don't call them inherent powers so much as plenary powers. These are things you won't find in a statute, but they're powers that we necessarily have as a court to function as a court. This is different from administrative tribunals. The Supreme Court in 
Trenchmontaine and Ontario uh, made the point that administrative tribunals don't have inherent powers. We have, powers, um, unlike administrative tribunals. Let me correct you on one other thing too. Um, you seem to equate, and many do this, um, you seem to equate the federal courts, the section 101 courts with statutory courts. Just want to point out that all courts of appeal in the country are also statutory courts. The Supreme Court has told us time and time again that, there, uh, that any appeals you have and any appeal courts are statutory in nature. They are not superior courts in the sense of you know, those with the jurisdiction of the high court in London way back when. So we aren't alone. Uh, we have lots of company as a statutory court. Uh, the Supreme Court itself is a statutory court under our section, Section 101 of the Constitution Act 1867. Um, uh, finally, uh, let's look at the Ontario Superior Court where, where you practice all the time. Uh, yeah, it's um, the great court with inherent, I say, residuary jurisdiction, according to the Supreme Court. But uh, I actually pulled just before our, our talk, um, this is the last version of the Ontario annual practice I have. Big, thick book. Pula, you got yours? You getting yours out? Yeah. No, there's a lot. It's your Bible. Um, yeah. These are statutory or legislative powers for this inherent court. So, you know, all courts these days, let's face it, let's get, let, let's, let's be real about this. They're all statutory courts. Mm -hmm. We just do different subject matters and our subject mm -hmm. matters tend to be in uh, federal jurisdiction and types of things that qualify for us as interesting areas like uh, tax communications, privacy, patents and ownership of ideas like copyright, indigenous peoples, national infrastructure like pipelines, railways, federal funding, including health care issues, national security and foreign affairs, uh, immigration, uh, refugees, freedom of information, federal privacy, uh, internet regulation, assuming the current federal bills get passed, any number of things. And uh, mm -hmm. lastly, I hope I haven't gone on too long, but you know, no. why, I, I, inherent in your question was also why a federal judiciary? Uh, do we need it? Um, because you say, and quite rightly, superior courts, if we weren't around, superior courts could do it. They'd have the jurisdiction to do it. But think of the chaos. You might have a tax deduction allowed in Lloydminster, Alberta, but disallowed in Lloydminster, Lloyd, Lloydminster Saskatchewan. Or you, you might have something um, uh, not disclosable under national security privilege in one province, but the same thing might be disclosable because they don't think the privilege applies. Uh, patents might be valid in one jurisdiction, but not in others. A copyright might be valid in one jurisdiction, but not in others. There might be uh, uh, an airline tariff in force in one jurisdiction, but not in another because of a differing court. Um, uh, a federal elections issue. You know, you could actually have a federal elections issue where an issue arises and, and uh, Alberta says one thing and Quebec says something else. Think of the chaos. The whole purpose of our system as, as uh, then Justice Minister John Turner said way back 50, approximately 50 years ago, 1971, he said, look, we need a federal court system for the uniform, uniform and interpretation and application of federal laws. Uh, Australia knows they need it and celebrates it. The United States knows they need it and celebrate it. We need it too. And I really uh, enjoyed this opportunity to say a little bit more about what the federal judiciary is, why it exists, and why it's a good thing. This is the best law lecture I've heard since I started <laughs> law school. Don't give me a microphone. It's a bad thing. I apologize, Pula. I want to give you a microphone. I'd love to do a part two eventually. Uh, you know, um, it's. Uh, I just want to uh, bring this 
a parallel, this comparison to its logical conclusion, yeah. uh, the, the comparison, the parallels between superior courts and federal courts, is there any uh, collaboration between uh, the two court systems, not in uh, uh, making the law or making the decisions, uh, but I'm talking about the workflow, the process, how uh, panels are established, for example, for courts of appeal, you know, the administrative issues. Do you have some kind of cooperation between the judges? Because you obviously can share a lot of experience with each other. Yes. Well, it's a shame, really, uh, because the judiciary is sometimes um, unnecessarily secretive over certain things. Um, you wouldn't believe uh, the amount of dialogue between courts and at uh, judicial conferences, particularly in the area of judicial education. As uh, a, now a relatively senior appellate judge in the Federal Court of Appeal, I know many, many appellate judges uh, across the country. Um, I, I teach and attend lots of these conferences, and you get to know them. Uh, I've been teaching new judges school since 1998 which means I teach administrative law to all the new judges that come in and you form a bond with many judges. Uh, some become your friend. Uh, there's nothing pernicious in this. Um, uh, when every judge gets a case, uh, the judge uh, decides it uh, themselves. There's nothing pernicious, but it's not uncommon for a judge to email someone they know and say, uh, you know, I'm wondering if there's a, a recent decision on X, counsel haven't told me about it. And, and we'll help each other that way between courts, sometimes within courts. Now, obviously, if the decision is really important, the Supreme Court in cases like Crown and Mian has, has uh, told judges, you know, you've got to let the parties know and give them a chance to to speak about the case. But uh, I would say there is a thriving, healthy, and very positive underground exchange of ideas between judges within courts and also between courts. I um, asked Law Twitter to uh, suggest questions for you. You are quite a popular judge and uh, Many people were excited when I told them that many lawyers were excited that when I told them that I would interview you. Sure. I want to start with a question about personal productivity. It came from sure. uh, Andrew Bernstein of Tories. He simply asked how uh, Justice Stratus does everything that he does. <laughs> well, that's that's. Uh, that's nice of Andrew. I, I, I am busy. I guess in answering that, I, I just want to tell you that um, as, as knowledgeable as Andrew is, um, he and, and all lawyers have no idea just how busy judges are. Do you mind if I start with that? Because there are a lot of unseen things that people just don't know about. Um, aside from orders, directions, reasons, and judgments that we release, um, there's lots of external things. Uh, in, in my case, I do a lot of judicial, judicial teaching, helping judges across Canada or within my own court. Uh, I attend lawyers' conferences uh, about 15 a year. I participate in, in podcasts, guest lectures, competitive moots. Um, there's some things you've mentioned, like the online administrative law and writing stuff and uh, practice and procedure. I teach a lot of writing at conferences and there's academic roles. I, I get invited to law schools to seminars and that sort of thing. But what's unseen is really the internal stuff. Um, I do three orientation lectures a year for law clerks. I'm on the Courts Administration Services Computing Committee the registry committee, which deals with a lot of issues of practice and procedure, I'm currently in the middle of an update of a judge's operations manual. I'm the full-time, senior full-time judge, which means I'm uh, the institutional memory for many judges of uh, what has happened at the court. And I get a lot of administration from the chief justice. Uh, in my personal life, a lot of mentoring of 
former Queens students, uh, former clerks, current clerks. I have to carve out time for supplemental reading and reflection. Um, and uh, I'm not alone. There are many people who are doing a large number of these other things. We're really busy. When you take into account 60 and 70, 70 somethings like us have their share of health problems, uh, it can get a little challenging. This is why the most important thing uh, is the size of judicial complement. And we badly need more judges. Um, that's just the truth of the matter. The federal court has doubled in size since 2002, but we've only increased by uh, 20%. Um, this is not good enough. Uh, so, so how do you manage your workload? Well, Pulat, as a busy lawyer, I could ask you the same question. You just have to be extremely disciplined uh, and, and uh, in terms of time. You have to um, program particular times to do certain things and be ruthlessly efficient at it. And also program times just to be a good colleague, to do a walk around uh, my floor here at the court. That's something I do. I just plan out time to do stuff and then impose a discipline on me to do it. Uh, law clerks, though, are great. Um, some law clerks really police me and keep me efficient. And I hugely appreciate that. Uh, in fact, there was another question uh, on Twitter about law clerks. What yeah. you look for in law clerks or what you appreciate in law clerks? Was every, sure, every judge is different. I think different judges hire different types of law clerks. I actually hire diversity, not so much. Uh, well, I have hired clerks with various Section 15-1 traits, if you want to call them like that. I've been pretty well all over the map on that. But I mean diversity in a different way, uh, diversity of interest, diversity of background, diversity of thought. As judges were somewhat cloistered and the threat is uh, you can stultify or be a little stale. I find law clerks from different backgrounds really um, wake me up and throw me into different worlds that I've never seen before. Uh, so, for instance, one, one excellent law clerk I had uh, uh, was in the military reserve and was also a, an accomplished musician. Uh, I don't have interests in either in a personal sense, but to be able to be exposed to that world is a wonderful thing. So I'm obviously looking for uh, academic excellence, uh, not necessarily top of the class. I'm looking for really good life experience because it informs good judgment. I'm looking for ability to research, but also I'm looking for that, uh, as I explained, a little bit of uh, diversity in the sense I explained it. After all, uh, in the federal court system, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's almost like you're choosing a roommate for a year. Uh, you really want someone who, who is going to be interesting and you're going to get along with. Speaking of diversity, there was a question about making courthouses and the judicial process more inclusive for people with disabilities, including wheelchair users. Yeah. And uh, just to add to that, is it more for the Federal Department of Justice or can judges themselves do something about this? Oh, we can do something about it. Um, we uh, can make recommendations to our administrators in, in um, the federal court system. It's the court's administrative service. And, and uh, they will deal with it. You know, a, an interesting feature, it's unique, uh, the federal court system, you look in our statute, every courthouse across the country, and I think we have 13 of them, has to, by law, contain a suggestion box. And if anyone has any suggestion uh, about some way that we can better serve the public and do our job better, you put the note in the suggestion box and, and by law that goes to the chief justice and has to be considered. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, the question comes as a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, if the person who posed that question uh, is acquainted with problems and more importantly has possible solutions, uh, we'd love to hear about it. And beyond that suggestion box, frankly, any uh, note written to any judge, particularly the chief justice, 
will be read. And, and we have a, 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 a rules committee that looks at all aspects of practice and procedure. And if you know, people sometimes propose really great ideas, really great solutions, and they become part of our practice and procedure. So I encourage, I encourage that person immediately to point out whatever problems that person perceives and even better offer some solutions if you can think of any. I know we don't have much time left, but I only have uh, three questions from Twitter left. And okay. perhaps we could do a rapid fire here. Sure. So a question from Caroline Mandel, who is well known to many judges, a leading uh, no. legal writing expert in uh, the country. Uh, your experience with re a verse of reading paper versus electronic factums right. beyond hyperlinks, what could counsel do to make uh, the electronic reading experience easier? Fonts, yeah. format, visuals. Yeah, lots of white space. Uh, in other words, don't don't uh, cram all the lines together. Put nice spaces between the paragraphs. It actually matters for a reason I'll mention in a moment. As well in your citations, uh, please don't use supra or infra. Imagine your, and again, I'll tell you something in a minute that will really underscore this. Imagine you're reading and uh, I see footnote 12. I go down to footnote 12 and it says uh, such and such a case supra. Um, all I want to know is what court decided the Smith case that's being footnoted. I have to disengage from the text uh, pinch it to make it smaller, um, then go back on my iPad, I'm using an iPad, and do a game of hide and speak, uh, hide and seek, scroll to the bottom and look, look for the uh, reference. It's even worse if it's not footnote 12, it might be footnote 154. That's an even longer game of hide and seek. And all I want to know is the damn court who decided it. Nothing more than that. And you're putting me through an involuntary game of hide and seek. And, and I've totally disengaged from your text and your message. Uh, I, I alluded to another factor, and I'll tell you about it now. The fact is that during the day, we're, we're really busy. We got hearings, we got visits from colleagues or visits to colleagues, discussions, meetings, all sorts of things. We often read at night and we're often kind of tired. The other thing about reading is we deal with so many different cases and so many different subject matters. We're almost punch drunk in the sense that our minds are flitting from topic to topic. So just imagine it's 1045 at night and someone at footnote 86 says supra and all i want to know is the damn court and you put me through an involuntary game of hide and seek how happy do you think i am yes a question from colin lachans a former canley uh, ceo yeah. views your views on developing pacer like access to a uh, federal yeah. court of appeal dockets for against if for what does you see, what do you see as needed to make it happen? Right, uh, right now, um, I will say the, uh, as a little bit of a plug. The federal court system is one of the most innovative and advanced in the country um, in its practices and procedures. We are right now looking. Um, we're functioning as an electronic court, like most courts, but and we're soon going to have a better e-filing system, but. Underneath that is going to be a new system similar to what's being asked about there. It's being developed. I'm on a committee. One of the things I didn't mention, I'm on a committee dealing with this. And that capability will be available. A tricky thing are policies and procedures that have to go into place, for example, to prevent data miners, people that will bulk download data for commercial purposes. Uh, another issue is, is uh, in some cases, privacy interests and so on. These are thorny issues. And the committee that I'm on is discussing these various issues. But yes, uh, we're, we're underway. It's just not deployed yet. There's still a lot of work and consideration that has to go into it. The last question from a Twitter that I want to ask you is how often the oral hearing affects your views of a case? 
Yeah, um, uh, we're always attentive. We're always keenly interested in what council have to say, but there is a certain reality here. Um, I've often, uh, Poulet, I've often analogized the advocacy game to a hockey game. And uh, a hockey game has three periods, as you know, 60 minutes in total, 20 minutes a period. And I guess my question for you is if we look at the advocacy game as two periods, 30 minutes each, like a hockey game, uh, and, and one component of the game is written advocacy and the other component is oral advocacy. Uh, when we walk into a courtroom, how much of the advocacy game is already over? How many minutes left in the game, Pulat, do you think the oral advocacy begins in terms of our consideration of the case? Do you have a guess? Uh, five. Yeah, close. I think I, I surveyed colleagues once on this, eight minutes left in mm. the game out of 60. Wow. wow. So, you know, written submissions and the record and the evidence in the case counts for an awful lot. And like in a hockey game, after 52 minutes of play, there's a score in the game. In some cases, it might be two to two. In other cases, it might be eight to two. One side may have it over the other side. So in answer to a question, we hit, we hit oral advocacy in the eight to two game. Oh, we're interested in listening, but it's going to be very difficult for the side that's behind to, to win the day. Uh, but in a number of cases, there's everything to play for because there are many questions arising from the written material that we've read and studied. Those are the two to two games. And oral advocacy counts for a lot. So in answer to the question, it really depends. Justice Stratus, like I said, this, uh, I think, has been much more than an interview. This has been a law lecture. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. But I, I wanted to uh, uh, hear a law lecture that I would enjoy. And I really enjoyed it. I think this, this conversation uh, has been dense. And it will require revisiting on my part, I will have to listen to it a few times, write down the citations, go look at the cases, lots of food for thought. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you. And I want to wish you all the best and all the success in your judicial career. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you, Pulat. And uh, all um, judges are concerned about is serving the public and, and uh, giving confidence to the public. And this has been a just a wonderful opportunity to try to increase understanding of who we are and what we do. So thank you.